Welcome back everyone. Yesterday we looked at why you should embrace online theological distance education. And I tried to persuade you that this is the future of theological education and that it's extremely effective and cost efficient. Now I imagine after yesterday's conversation there are probably three groups of people in our audience today. Firstly, there are some who didn't buy a word of it. You are just not convinced by this push towards online distance education. And my advice to you for the rest of this session is that it's probably not going to be terribly relevant to you. You may do well to go and make a cup of coffee, spend some time in prayer, and come back for the next conversation. Secondly, there are people who are still on the fence with respect to whether you believe and want to pursue distance education. And then lastly, there would be a group of people who would be saying, yes, we believe this is a key component of the future of theological education. How do we make a start? And so my assumption is that I'm talking to those who serve in residential theological institutions. So your, your current reality is that you teach at a contact mode. And your question is, how do we begin to make this transition to operating in a distance mode, particularly an online distance mode. And so I want to be very practical today. That's our key question, by the way. How do we make a start to operating online? And I want to be very, very practical. This is not going to be the current theory, the current research. This is simply going to be some practical advice on how we go about this. And I want to do four things, essentially. Firstly, I want to tell you one story my own, and we'll keep that very brief. And then I want to give you a couple of definitions, because I think they, they're often murky, even in the literature. And then thirdly, I want to give you four tips for moving online. And then lastly, I want to give you four reasons why this sometimes fails. So that's our agenda for the next while. Firstly, let me tell you a little of my own story because I did my formative theological studies by distance education. I became a follower of Jesus when I was 16 years old, was apprehended by my Lord and Savior and, and immediately sensed this call from God to study and to prepare myself for a life in ministry. But there was a problem. I was suffering from a fairly debilitating disease at that stage of life. And my health condition simply made it impractical for me to attend and participate in a traditional uh, residential uh, university program, whether theology or, or anything else for that matter. And so the only option available was a correspondence-based study option. And so as an 18-year-old, I began doing a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology through ICI, the International Correspondence Institute. It had a good reputation it was recognized as an accredited program in our country, and so it would give me options to study further. And so how it worked essentially was that the institution would send me study materials. Typically, it was a study guide and one or two textbooks for each course. I would work through the study material on my own. I would complete the assignments and the, and the quizzes which were posted to me. Uh, the exam was posted to an invigilator in the city where I was living. I'd write the exam and it would be sent back to the institution by post and several months later I would get results for a course, by which time I'd probably completed two or three other courses in the interim. And I did my entire four-year Bachelor of Arts degree in that modality. Now you might imagine, well, that by all the standards of what makes for good distance education theory today, that must have been a terrible experience. But actually, it was a terrific experience. I grew like Jack's beanstalk in my relationship with the Lord, in my ministry skills, in my knowledge. It really was an amazing experience. I'm not even sure I would trade my BA journey for an Oxford degree. Maybe I would, might have to think about it. But honestly, it was an amazing experience. And this is counterintuitive. How could I have had such a transformative learning experience when the program I was doing didn't tick so many of the boxes that we now consider to be best practice 
in distance education? Well, it was amazing for a few reasons, and I'll single out three of them. Firstly, the institution provided great content. The content was biblical, it was practical, it was missional. So the content provided was, in my opinion, first rate. Second, I had an amazing community around me in my local church. I had a pastor who took an interest in my journey and invested into me. And so my local church community was a, a, a context for growth, for nurture, for development. And then thirdly, I had a context where everything I was learning, I could apply and practice in my context, in my local church and ministry contexts. And so there, there was this tight integration of practice and theory as I went through the program, which makes for incredibly good learning. And then lastly, I might mention that God's hand was upon my life. The Holy Spirit had a plan and he was working in me through the content, through application to context, through the community that was helping to mold my walk with Christ. You know, ultimately, we don't raise up shepherds for God's kingdom. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We are at best junior partners as theological educators. We provide content, we provide some support, but ultimately it's God at work that equips somebody to be his servant. Now briefly, a couple of definitions, because I'm not sure we always get these right, and particularly if you read literature that's coming out of North America, there is some skewing in these definitions. The first definition I want to talk about is distance education. What is distance education? Well, distance education is any formal educational process where the teacher and the student are separated by geographical distance. Much of the modern literature assumes that distance education means online education. But that's not necessarily the case. That has simply become so standard in contexts where everyone has access to the internet and there are obvious advantages in in being connected virtually if you can't be connected physically. But distance education can be offline distance education. It doesn't have to be online. And that brings us to our second term. What is online education or somewhat interchangeably e-learning? Well, e-learning is learning that has an electronic component to mediate it. My son is in grade five. Had to think about that. My son is in grade five at the moment, and the school at which he is at incorporates a lot of technology into the classroom. Now, this is not a distance program. It's a classroom-based school system, but they are using a lot of e-learning to enrich the classroom experience. There's a sense in which at least a component of his program is e-learning, but it's not distance learning. You see the difference? And then thirdly, there is online distance education. Now that obviously combines those two, where it's distance education because the student is not at the institution, and it's online because we use the internet essentially to mediate the interactions between the student and the institution. So we are talking primarily about online distance education, but online distance education is basically just a particular application of distance education, which can be effective in its own right. So that's enough background, a little of my personal story, and a few quick definitions. Now, four tips for moving online. So how do we start? How do we move online? And, and particularly in contexts where not everyone is fully computer literate or where the cost of bandwidth is still something of a limitation. And I really wanna offer four tips in this space. Number one, treat the best practice literature with a little bit of caution. Treat the best practice literature with a bit of caution. Robert Heinlein says, always ask the experts. They will tell you what can't be done and why, and then do it. <laughs> Don't be a slave to what the experts say is normal or necessary. Now, why do we need to treat the best practice literature with a little bit of caution? Well, the vast majority of it comes out of the American context. And what doesn't come out of the American context likely comes out of a European context, or in some cases, 
from Asia. But it's coming from contexts where technology is much more affordable and readily available than it is in some parts of Africa and where everyone has the requisite devices and connectivity to function online. So many of us in Africa do not live in that same reality. The place where I live and work is, is more or less there now, but it wasn't there 10 years ago. And so the kind of distance education we offered 10 years ago was a far cry from what the journal literature was saying is best practice. Why? Because it simply wasn't practical, given our contextual realities, to try to implement much of what was considered to be best practice. So if bandwidth is really limited or expensive, you can't make extensive and unlimited use of video as a medium. If people have intermittent access to the internet, then daily discussions that presuppose that they're online all the time may not be viable. So you need to measure your context, assess your context, and figure out which of the good practice guidelines are viable for you to implement. Secondly, treat the pressure to build online community with a measure of skepticism. Treat the pressure to build an online community with a measure of skepticism. Joanne Deasy says, students who come to seminary with years of ministry experience are often not seeking to improve their pastoral skills, but to increase knowledge that will serve their preaching and teaching. In other words, she says, their primary purpose for coming is to gain biblical and theological insight. It's not necessarily to improve their practical skills. And what she doesn't cover, but which is implied, I think, is that they also don't come primarily for spiritual formation from an online seminary. Now, the online theological distance ed literature is obsessed with two terms, spiritual formation and online community. If you start reading it, every article goes on about online community and spiritual formation. These are the two hot potato topics in the literature. My advice when someone's telling you about these and how critically important they are to offering online theological distance education is that you smile politely, that you nod, and then you ignore 80% of what is said. Now, it's not that we're against online community. It's really helpful to the extent that we can build it. But in some of our contexts, what is deemed to be best practice in terms of building online community is simply impractical and unachievable at the moment. Maybe it will be in time to come, but right now you possibly can't do that. Your distance ed students will mostly be mature believers. They've got a lot of ministry practical experience. They are probably recognized as godly people and leaders in their church. And their primary reason for registering for theological studies is to deepen their, their, their skills in rightly handling the Word of God. Yes, if we can be mentors and disciples to, to an extent, that's a good idea. If we can build a sense of community, that's really helpful. But it's not absolutely critical to offering a worthwhile, effective program. Just think of my own story. I, I didn't know the name of a single person at the institution, and yet I had an amazing journey and learned so much. In the process of preparing this lecture, I dropped a note on one of our discussion platforms for the SAT students and essentially asked them, you know, what are you looking for? What were you looking for when you decided to do an online theological program? Were you looking for for Bible knowledge? Were you looking for ministry skills training? D did you expect the inst institution to be uh, a kind of discipler and, and play a role in spiritual formation? Unanimously, the feedback, first, second, and third positions on my tabulation would say, we came here to increase our knowledge of the scriptures, to rightly handle the word of God. A few people mentioned ministry skills as a secondary consideration. One or two mentioned the need for a formal qualification, uh, and most of them mentioned that it would be nice to have an intellectual community at the seminary with which they can explore ideas. Nobody, not one respondent, said we expect 
the online seminary to play a crucial role in our formation. They all said, our church does that for us. Let me read just a few responses to you. This was Pierre. He said, I am studying because I want to deepen my knowledge of the Bible and my ministry skills. My family, local church and workplace is definitely my primary community and place for formation, for life and ministry. Mancha says, my primary community is my local church and I come to sets to deepen my knowledge. Notice a the theme. Jean says, I have many years of experience in ministry. My main goal or aim was to gain knowledge and how to apply it more effectively in ministry. It was not to be spiritually formed. Daniel says, I agree. He means I agree with the students who have posted their thoughts before me. That I do not look to the seminary to disciple me as it is a distance institution. Instead, I rely more on my local church for fellowship and discipleship. My main hope in studying is to increase my knowledge of the Bible and theology, which besides being useful for ministry, would ideally also encourage growth in my personal spiritual life. And lastly, Natasha says, my main motivation for studying theology is to deepen my knowledge of scripture and to ensure that I use sound methods of interpretation. They do want the seminary to be a discussion partner on key ideas. They would appreciate there being an intellectual community to the extent that is practical, but they're primarily looking to grow in their knowledge of how to interpret, apply, and faithfully handle the truth of God's word. That was the longest of my uh, practical tips. So the first one was treat the authoritative literature with a grain of salt. Secondly was be a little skeptical of the obsession in much of the conversation about spiritual formation and building online community. Thirdly, what makes for good distance education, especially for theology? Well, here's the formula. Content plus context plus challenge equals growth. Content plus context plus challenge equals growth. What do we mean by that? Well, while being part of a healthy online community is really helpful, the nuts and bolts that make distance education effective are great content, which is applied into the student's real life context by means of really challenging real world assignments. You do those things, even if you have minimal interaction with the students and they will learn and they will grow because those are the nuts and bolts. According to the Center for Creative Leadership, leaders form best when they have three things, excellent content, developmental relationships, and challenging real world assignments. And the real world assignments are more critical than the content and relationships added together in the formation of a leader. That's according to the center. So challenging real world assignments are absolutely critical to effective learning, especially at a distance. So if a distance education program provides great content, and if they set challenging real world assignments that force students to engage with their primary community, their church and, and their society, that in and of itself is enough to produce effective learning. And then if they have the added benefit of developmental relationships, those would tend to be with their local church, but they could equally, if possible, be with people in the seminary if you have the platforms to provide that kind of community, then that rounds out the deal and, and makes for a great learning experience. So friends, content, plus context, plus challenge, equals growth. So the point is that distance education works well, even if it's quite simple, even if it's relatively low tech, it doesn't even have to be online. And that's why things like mixed mode programs work so well. And they do work well. So by mixed mode, I mean, the kind of model where students are in their context for an extended period of time, and while they're in their context, they work through content that's provided and they complete assignments which require them, if it's well constructed, to engage their local context in challenging real world ways. And then 
every so often they come together in a face-to-face -face session, maybe for a week or two, and, and, and they have this intensive. So there they meet the lecturers, they form community with other students. This is a kind of distance education, and it's extremely effective if it's well compiled. Now, you can even do this without being online. Being online is better because the connectivity that a, an online platform provides can take a lot of the distance out of distance education. It allows elements of learning that you can't easily replicate in an offline space. But the nuts and bolts that make distance education effective are great content, a real world context, and challenging assignments. Community is great, but I would say it's secondary. Therefore, friends, how do you start? How do you start moving online? My advice here is that you begin with simple, accessible options. You don't need to be high tech to be high impact. You can create great distance learning if you do those fundamentals really well, great context, challenging, I mean, great content, real world context and challenging assignments that bring those elements together in a fairly low tech space. You can use simple technology that would fit the needs of your students, maybe fairly low bandwidth if that's all that they can afford and have access to. Um, and then as your context is able to support it, you can gradually up the ante in terms of the contextual demands. I'm sorry, I mean in terms of the technology demands of the program. Um, you can introduce new technologies that allow you to do things that you couldn't in a slightly less, uh, less high-tech modality. So keep it simple when you start. You don't need to start with all the bells and whistles that might be considered best practice in, say, a North American context. Two practical suggestions here, though. Number one, when you choose technology, choose it with your eye a little bit on the horizon. Don't set your sights so low that you use only the minimum that's available now. Stretch your students just a little so that you are building somewhat for a future reality. And secondly, be very careful of timeless courses. You know, whatever modality you use, make sure that there are firm deadlines that hold students accountable. Uh, if you don't, your throughput and completion rates will drop fairly significantly. So those are some practical tips to get started. Now, finally, why do many institutions find this so difficult and why do so many fail when trying to move online? Uh, four reasons, and I'll keep these very brief. Firstly, wrong purpose. Wrong purpose. If you're going to offer online theological distance education, this needs to be missional. Your purpose is to train and equip people and to do this brilliantly and effectively, and it needs to be central, a high priority within the institution. If it's added on as some kind of a tack on just as a third stream of income, oy, knocking over things here. If, you know, if it's just a quick way to get income, uh, etc., and, and you relegate it to a little department in the institution, it's never going to work. So many have the wrong purpose. It's either got to be critical to your mission as an institution or don't, don't waste your time and resources. Secondly, the wrong people. Many institutions, perhaps out of necessity, try to go online using the, the same people who excel in a classroom. And many times the lecturer who's brilliant in a classroom is not brilliant online and vice versa. It's a different skill set and different calling and gifting. Some are good at both, but many don't make that transition easily. So you need to recognize that you need people for whom teaching online fits their calling, their personality, their gifting, and their passion. And if you try to go online with reluctant lecturers who are being compelled to do it, kicking and screaming, that doesn't work. It's a major reason for failure. A third one is wrong pedagogy, by which, by which I mean often when institutions make the move from classroom to online, they try to replicate what they do in the classroom in an online environment, and this doesn't work well. So when you're teaching online, you've got to think through how do we reimagine our course 
maybe keeping the outcomes or objectives the same, but how we go about achieving them has to be conceptualized quite differently uh, for a different space. You can't, you know, stick a camera in a classroom, record the videos, post those online, and think that that's going to fly. That's a bit of a reductionistic approach, but but other methods often, you know, try to replicate what you do in a classroom, and it's not terribly effective. And then the last one is just a lack of resources, not having the infrastructure or the personnel to um, build a learning management system, manage that, keep it going. Tomorrow, we're going to introduce you to what may be a hopeful solution to that, a hopeful and affordable way of being able to provide a system that could take your institution online. I'll introduce you to somebody who's doing, I think, some amazing work in that space. And that's it from my side for today. Thank you so much for engaging. Uh, we've been talking about how do we make the move from traditional to online distance education. Uh, and the high level point I want to leave you with is don't overcomplicate this. Uh, you don't have to keep up with everything that the North American literature says is good practice. Some of it simply won't be doable in your context yet. It may be over time. But even if you create fairly simple, um, modest, moderately low-tech uh, offerings. If you've got great content and you capitalize on the fact that students are in communities, their local churches, and you get them to do challenging assignments in real-world contexts, they will grow and they will be formed into the image of Christ in amazing ways. This really does work, even if it's not uh, exceptionally high-tech. So I'll leave you with those thoughts and look forward to speaking to you again tomorrow.